you know what you're talking about, you're short. Right? Um, the basic thing is that you can uh, understand on three ontological levels, behavior, uh, functioning, mechanism, which produce that behavior, and organizing principles, which are laws. So organizing principles in biology are analogous to laws in physics. For example, just uh, feedback is an organizing principle. Negative, positive feedback is a mechanism, and so on. So the question is, uh, how do you uh, understand, try to understand on these three levels? And the fundamental is, of course, organizing principle level. Now, uh, you cannot uh, the start from the data. You have to have some assumption. Darwin said way back that you always have to start with a view to be considered. So the question is, what is the you, uh, what is your assume organizing principle? And here you are going into uh, interdisciplinary domain. For example, I was working with Herbert Simon on uh, boundary rationality, and that concept was in, applied to describe organizing principle between the levels. It's called boundary autonomy of levels. Within the given boundary autonomy of levels, in, uh, levels do not interact. It is the, the uh, points at the end where they start interacting. Or regarding uh, em emerging, right? Classical approach is to say that the, uh, the systems on the first level have to be nonlinear. But in biology, you, if you say linear, nonlinear, it's like saying elephants and non-elephants. <coughs> so you need m more different characterization. And the one which was proposed and so on is monotonicity, which is, plays the role. And the third then aspect is uh, really a hub coordination. Because uh, again, in order to understand the whole system, you have to look on all three levels. And the third level, there is a principle of balance coordination principles. And I can uh, visualize a number of uh, studies which I have seen, where underlying is a uh, balance uh, coordination principle. That is, there is an overall uh, level which actually influences the first level so that everyone gets whatever it wants. So this is just example of organizing principles. And uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, especially to understand the brain, uh, it is very important to look into organizing principles. And final comment I, I have is that brain is considered as a network. Now, US economy is a network, producers and consumers, right? What does it tell you? It is a description, it is a restriction, and so on. But the question is how the system functions. Mike, Mike. Oh, no, the, I'll be in five minutes. Go on a minute. Now, about two weeks ago or so, it was announced a, a, a process to look into neurons to see what the neurons are do, doing. It, it's called clarity. That's the name of the. Of the and so, you have to study uh, functioning on all the three levels, including neuron. So that's now, uh, since I study these organizing principles, whoever of these presentations would like to, you know, for me to respond, what kind of principle am I suggest? I'll be glad to. Is it, thank Maybe you. You should join us up here. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you should join us up here. <laughs> Any, do you uh, have any comments on that? I just think that uh, naturally you do have to think about principles, but you've also got to get a lot of data in order to begin to form the principles. So hopefully these things work together.
but you know, you get feeling for these principles outside of looking at data. In data, you do not see principles. Right. So you have I, to I think there are many ways to approach oh, yeah, sure. the brain or any other aspect sure, sure, of biology. Right. I think I, I try to have as few assumptions going in as possible and simply ask how something works. But and But you have to have, even to design an experiment, you have a certain automatic bias. You have to have it. So, but I, I try to think we that want, what we do is very empirical. We want organizing principles. Right. Just one more example about it. You know, if you look into evolution, Right. You know, I think we better move on to some it's of the a, other the questions. The point he was making was discussions. that evolution is filled with random events, and yet there are principles from which evolve. Right. right. Yes. We can, the next so question. Can, the Thank next you. Question. <laughs> so first of all, I wanted to say this is a, a great uh, set of talks. I don't know how I've gone through my whole life without hearing Linda Buck talk about the olfactory system. So it was really a treat, and it was a great treat uh, for, for uh, Dr. Biggs. So let me start with a question to you. So uh, there have been a lot of discussion of gene expression, of course, uh, up to um, uh, amongst the speakers, and you talked about neural transmission or the, uh, or the movement of signals, really, or firing. So I was wondering, what about the criticality of gene expression? You know, we, we typically, when we see genes that really look interesting in a given process, it's very much like the form that you showed for the criticality, that is, an on and an off. And a sort of differential modeling of gene expression gives some wonderful views on that. I was wondering how that might fit in. To your, uh, to your system of criticality of thinking about it. And for Linda, I have a question that uh, it's also directed to Mary Beth and Christoph Koch. So um, I was, <laughs> I was, I, I'm sorry, Mary Beth. <laughs> I, I, was, I was taken, of course, by Christoph's uh, sort of big view on how to spend a billion dollars or several hundred million dollars. <laughs> Uh, but then I was thinking when Mary Beth came up and, and championed the cerebellum is that, you know, 50 years ago for Mar and Albus, we sort of knew how the cerebellum worked. Uh, and then Masa Ito talked to us about a long-term depression. And we were talking about, you know, decision-making within the brain. I'm wondering if the granule cells could vote, as Mary Beth implied, they would far outweigh the visual system, and maybe that should be the system to look at, or maybe the olfactory system. Um, so I guess the issue about the olfactory system is that you've gone down in impressive detail. Uh, and I'm wondering where, that for a mouse, the olfactory system is by far the ascendant system in guiding behavior versus the visual system. And so that says something right there. And I guess I'd like to know a little more about complex uh, sort of cognitive behaviors and consciousness in the olfactory system and how that might play out. So, two quick questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not really studying consciousness, but um, I think one thing that we're finding rather interesting now is to see whether um, mixtures, whether you can modify an outcome with a smell by combining different smells that have different impacts or even can you modify fear with an odor stimulus? But that doesn't really get at consciousness. That's not really, I, I feel that for a, we can't really study consciousness. We try to study things that are within our grasp using the approaches that we take and the kinds of tools that we have. Now I think that this is maybe a better question for Anne actually, consciousness and, and habits. So but before, maybe you can before Ed this. speaks, can I just ask a related question? Yeah. I mean, um, the olfactory system, you've, you've investigated how it um, connects to innate responses, fear and sex, things like we're, that. We're trying, yes. Um, but memory is, is an interesting concept to me because it's, um, it's sparked by really clear odors in a really yes. remarkable way. We've all experienced it, and I wonder whether you've looked at yeah. that. 
I, no, I'm not sure. What, what would you do? How would you I do don't it? know. You're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with clarity we could image everything happening in the entire brain under, you know, in response to a novel odor versus one that's been associated with particular rewarding or, right. or um, other kinds of stimuli, then we could begin to address that. But, and that's what's so exciting about these new technologies that have been developed. Um, I think it opens the door to experiments that uh, we couldn't have uh, dreamed of doing, you know, even a year right. ago. So it's a very exciting time for neuroscience, I think. And? Yeah. So, so this whole issue of consciousness, um, you're right, we can't really study this as a very lofty kind of concept and more philosophy, but I am, I must say, um, very, very tempted to consider some of what we're seeing in these animals, and also we do a lot of interaction with neurologists and psychiatrists, who, who have this as a, a, a central and core issue. And I, I, I don't think it's impossible to go, we can go into awareness. But what I told you was that in, for all intents and purposes, uh, an automatic, you would think non-conscious behavior, if we can um, extrapolate from these little mice and rats, the, the brain, some parts of the brain are, are monitoring or give, giving online permission, something along those lines. So do those parts just not have access to this mysterious conscious perception and I think that actually your idea of multiple brain regions somehow synchronizing at a certain moment, maybe it's a critical <laughs> point of criticality, that, exactly. So that's sort of where we're going and why we're looking at many different brain signals simultaneously. We're looking for that. So for Linda, uh, John, do you have a oh, sorry, John. I just yeah. wanted to address his question about uh, our molecular networks critical, and I just wanted to point people to the work of uh, Ilya Smulovich here at uh, the ISB. One of the things he's done is he's perturbed, he and his colleagues have perturbed these networks and looked at trajectories. He's found that many of the networks are very close to a critical point. And this work goes back to Stuart Kaufman. Uh, he's done models with that since the 60s. So yes, there is definitely a connection between those things. So Linda, I, noticed, I thought I noticed that the odor of chocolate you listed as a pheromone. And what is it, what does the odor of chocolate do as a pheromone? Well, that actually, I don't remember the name of it. It actually has kind of a chocolate, chocolate nutty uh, yeah. smell. Even, even to us, it smells, like, it smells like a Snickers bar, kind of. But it does, you know, it's reported to have a pheromone effect in mice. But I think that the... But not in people, perhaps? <laughs> Human pheromones are, are not, have not been identified. Um, but I think that something could conceivably act as a pheromone, but also be perceived. Because remember the, the perception of odors, it doesn't, we don't, I think the way the olfactory system works, it's not, it doesn't selectively recognize odors that are going to have a particular smell. It just basically, it's like the immune system. It can recognize anything, okay? And those things then, can be perceived as having an odor. Pheromones, I see as being more hardwired. And so we don't know how that works. We think that since the outcome of smelling a pheromone is usually stereotype behavior, um, changes in hormone levels, there should be hardwired neural circuits. But that, that would be neurons in the brain somewhere that are are taking that information and sending it to the uh, neurons that would then mediate the specific effects, behavioral or hormonal effects. So, so I think you can have both. That leads to my next question is you mentioned immunology and in immunology we have these days the hygiene hypothesis that we're perhaps raising our children in too clean an environment. Uh, I'm wondering in our modern lifestyles we're using lots of soaps and you know, antiperspirants and, 
and uh, perfumes and such. And are we masking uh, a lot of our uh, odorant signals that we should be picking up? I mean, that's kind of a speculative well, thing. But. if there are social, if odors are important for social interactions, maybe. But I don't think We're missing has. clues and keys of interaction, yeah. Well, I don't know. But I, I think that we do have, we still have a lot of odors in our environment and food and... So yeah, but we're really asking an awful lot of them. Yeah, okay. Two quick questions. Uh, first one is for Linda. Do you suspect that two uh, different individuals can um, smell the same order differently and produce different response? And if so, can you train a particular brain towards one order and, you know, kind of through the evolution, create some sort of memory that you cannot create for others? There's a question for you. And the second question for Terry, that um, single cell heterogeneities that exist in cancer and the cancer stem cell hypothesis is basically driving the current research to a great extent. And what's your thought on that? Thank you. Okay, with, there are polymorphisms in the odor receptor genes in humans, and in some cases, a person has what's called a specific anosmia, where the person cannot has a seemingly has a normal sense of smell, but cannot uh, smell a particular odor, like a uh, vestry from musk, the macrocyclic musk in about 12 percent of the population. And in fact, I can't smell musk, so I'm a musk anosmic. And um, there is evidence out there now, not for the musk uh, anosmia, but for another anosmia, that indeed a single OR gene uh, can be responsible for a large part of the variation among humans. So now, in cases of odorants uh, that are recognized by many different ORs, you probably won't see that. And probably these are cases where there aren't very many receptors that are involved in smelling a particular odor. Yeah, so the uh, first I'll address the cancer stem cell hypothesis, which has led to a lot of confusion in the literature. So some people have taken it to mean that there's a, an adult uh, stem cell, normal stem cell, that's a target for cancer. Um, and so that's sort of a misnomer. Some people call them cancer-initiating cells. Um, which is also sort of a misnomer. They're sort of cancer-propagating cells. And so these are cells that uh, when you take all the cells in a tumor, and generally people fact sort them by markers, uh, can take a population and dilute it down to a very small number of cells and transplant it, and it can generate a tumor, whereas other cells can't. Um, so that's clearly the case, and it's been shown best in the hematopoietic system that could be manipulated. There's a lot of murky literature on that, where people will just simply fact sort cells based on a marker they find in another cancer um, uh, initiating cell paper uh, and say these are cancer initiated cells. So there's a lot of, of, of crazy literature out there. What really has to be done is to show that it's a, a cell that can replicate itself, self-renew, and give rise to all the other cell types within the cancer. Um, and very few studies have done that. So right now, it's, it's a theory without a lot of, um, of, of real support. At the same time, there are some good studies that suggest that these are the cells in the tumor that are the most resistant to treatment. And so it's something we have to pay attention to, uh, whether that's the case or not. And if it is the case, we have to figure out how to treat those cells. Because if you uh, treat a tumor, most of it disappears, but those uh, cells that can seed a tumor are the ones that remain. You're always going to get cancer back. In terms of the diversity in the, the tumor, that's actually something that's fascinating and something that is really important to, to talk about with respect to these single cell types of in vitro studies. Um, because as I mentioned, in a tumor, you've got a microenvironment. And all the signals coming into the, all the cells in the tumor in the microenvironment are the other tumor cells. So there are studies that say you can actually get a wild type cell to behave like a tumor cell based on autocrine and paracrine types of activities. It'll behave like that within the tumor, but if you take it out as a single cell isolate and analyze it in vitro, it's not going to behave like that at all unless you can recreate that milieu 
in vitro. So I see that as a real barrier right now, and what we have to do is to continue to go forward with the in vitro studies because you, you simply don't have the technology to study everything in vivo, but to always check yourself against the in vivo situation because I can see us creating a lot of theories and hypotheses that just won't hold in in vivo. So uh, it's complicated, um, but uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. It's, it's an organ, basically, within that tissue. Saying to find organized physics, one has to go outside, perhaps, of the immediate. Question? <coughs> a comment about uh, some of the things that were raised here about uh, connection between olfaction system and memories. Um, I study pair bonding, I'll talk about that later today, where that's a case where you have uh, the olfaction system being involved in creating a social relationship between two individuals and some learning occurring. But there's some interesting studies done by Jim Faust in Concordia University where he would take rats, male rats, and expose them to a female uh, that had been uh, scented with cadaverine. And initially rats don't like, they don't like cadaverine. It's, it's the smell of death. They avoid it. But if that female was an estrus and he got to mate with that female, then he got rewarded. And then he, he did that over and over and over again for two weeks, mating a male with a, with a female that smelled like cadaverine. Later, after that training period, if that male was given a choice between a female that smelled like cadaverine and just a regular smelling female, he was turned on by that female that smelled, smelled like cadaverine. So somehow, even though he may be smelling the same scent, the reaction that's occurring in the brain is very different to a, a, a novel, I mean to a untrained male versus a one trained. So I think it's very interesting to try to understand how do those connections get made? Um, and that sort of changes your perception of the odors. Yes? Hi, this question for Dr. Buck. Um, I find it surprising that uh, one highly restrictive OR per OSN can lead to such a rich repertoire of reactions what role does epigenetic regulation play in OR expression? Um, it's not the epige There's nothing known about epigenetic control of OR gene expression. It is a mystery how the developing neuron comes to express only one <laughs> OR gene. It looks like it's random, a random choice, at least from among a zonal subset of genes. Um, if it's not understood, but it seems like there is a feedback um, that goes on inside the cell, so that the cell knows whether it's picked a functional OR gene or a pseudogene. If it's picked a pseudogene, it makes another cho choice. <coughs> if it's picked a functional gene, um, it doesn't make any other choice, and it goes on to express that one OR throughout life. So, is does that address your question? Okay, thank you. I think we'll uh, now thank our speakers <coughs> for.